So I'm Robin Cresswell of the Department of Comparative Literature, and I want to begin by thanking uh, Yale's translation initiative, the Department of Comparative Literature, and also the Faculty Development Fund. It's a real pleasure and an honor and a treat um, for me to introduce tonight the translator, poet, editor, essayist, fiction writer, nonfiction writer, uh, Damien Searles. And as you'll have gathered from that long list, um, it really isn't easy to know where to begin in one's introduction of Damien, uh, as with the Rorsach test about which he's written so uh, wonderfully, one's bound to emphasize certain things to the detriment of others. And so uh, what you say will end up being a reflection as much about uh, one own, one's own um, interest and in limited reading um, than Damien's actual and rather massive accomplishments. So with tonight's talk in mind, however, uh, I wanna begin with the translations, which are, I should say, uh, myriad and delightful. Damien is uh, a kind of one man bibliotheque. He has translated from the German, Norwegian, Dutch, and French, uh, novels by Krista Wolf and Patrick Modiano, lectures by Nietzsche, poems by Rilke, short stories by Walser and Döblin, letters by Bachmann. And again, I'm only referring to the things that uh, I've actually read. Perhaps most imposingly, and quite recently, Damien has translated into English for the first time, the four volumes of Uwe Johnson's Anniversaries. At nearly 1700 pages long, the Times critic writes, it is oceanic and it is a masterpiece. And I happen to agree. Damien has written a book of short stories, what we were doing and where we were going. And also the book that I just um, alluded to, the Ink Blots, Herman Rorsach, his iconic test and the power of seeing, which is a truly thrilling, enjoyable study that begins with the man and his test developed in a remote asylum in the Alps and soon extends into manners of philosophical phenomenology, the nature of empathy, the uh, military draft. Um, by the end, writes Elif Batuman, one feels that Rorsach and his test are the key to understanding the whole 20th century. And again, I would agree. One might be surprised, though only for a moment, that a translator might choose the Rorsach test as a subject. But of course, the idea that in a given situation, that what we see in a given situation often reveals as much about, um, about our own selves about our obsessions and our quirks as it does about the things that we're looking at is of course an idea that keeps many translators up at night uh, with translation as with the famous ink blots. There's no right answer, but whatever answer you give might end up saying a lot about who you are. So Damien is one of the rare and exciting writers who is both a practicing and expert translator as well as a cultural historian and with a serious interest in philosophy. So those of you in attendance, you might have come across the idea that the theory of translation, that rich corpus of works from St. Jerome to Walter Benjamin and beyond, um, that this corpus bears the same relation to actual translation as the second law of thermodynamics um, relates to cooking. That is to say, not at all, um, even though the law needs to work in order for the cooking to get done. And I've been tempted by this idea myself in some moods, um, particularly when thinking of my own translations, but, but this divorce of theory from actual practice is deeply unsatisfying. Um, and it's one of the great virtues and pleasures, frankly, of reading Damien that he consistently situates um, the practice of translation in a wider network of actions, cognitive, educational, linguistic, and cultural, all of which illuminate the other. And it is this broad humanistic approach to the subject that makes his work so exciting. And so it is with great anticipation that I look forward to his lecture tonight, which is entitled Reading Like a Translator, A Philosophical Approach. Um, it comes from or is related to a, a book that he's working on currently called The Philosophy of Translation. And after the talk, um, Professor Paul North of the German department here at Yale will have a conversation with Damien about the lecture and about his thoughts on translation 
more broadly. So Damien, please please join me in welcoming Damien and um, I look forward to it, Damien, very much. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank you so much for that introduction and Peter Cole and Paul North, who we'll be uh, seeing as well as hearing from later. Um, I, I'm very honored to be giving this talk and it has a, a an extra feeling of, of homecoming since I was supposed to give it in 2020, but it was canceled because Yale decided that there's no possible way to have a talk like this over Zoom. Um, here we are having it over Zoom. And um, let me just get right into it so that there's time um, for a good discussion and any questions afterwards. Um, I'm currently not seeing anybody except for me, but I'm gonna assume that the audio is okay and a good volume. If someone wants to just put in the chat, maybe Robin or, or someone in the audience, if the volume's good. Someone has said good, so no one else has to do it anymore. Okay. Um, the first part of, of my title is reading like a translator, um, because I think it's indisputable that translation is a certain kind of writing that's linked to a certain kind of reading. Um, that's not a definition of translation yet, because we haven't said what kind of reading and writing they are and how they go together. But I think it's undeniably true as far as it goes that translating is reading one text and writing another where there's some specific coordination between the two. In this relationship, I'd argue that writing like a translator is pretty much the same as any other kind of writing. A translator uses the resources of the language that they're writing in to produce a text that'll be read or received within the context of that language. A translation into English is gonna find its place in a literary universe and a literary marketplace of other texts in English. So a translator of say Chinese poetry has to find a version of English poetry in which the poems will make sense to the English readers. The translator can't do whatever it is the writers in Chinese are doing. They can't lean on the resources of the Chinese language. They can't try and do what the original text is doing. They have to make a text that does something worthwhile in English. It's true a translator operates under some especially strong constraints to produce a text that's a translation of the original, not some random other new thing. But every writer operates under constraints of genre, tradition, readerly expectations, and the language itself. Even if you're writing your very own novel, you still have to do what a novel is supposed to do in English in 2021 in the United States or wherever you are. In the realist tradition or some existing anti-realist tradition or else you have to recognizably push against those expectations that's how you and everybody else will know that what you're writing is a novel in english as opposed to some other thing so we have a difference in degree from the constraints on producing a translation but not a substantive qualitative difference Translation is unlike other cases because it involves another language, but there are some contexts where that particular difference makes a difference and others where it doesn't really matter. So for example, if you're talking about interpretations of a text, the fact that the translation is in a different language is just a technicality. Um, so while writing as a translator is just writing, uh, I think that reading as a translator is different from just reading. So my philosophical account of translation here is about what it means to read like a translator. And so here's where I'm going to swerve and talk mostly about the philosophy of perception. Um, perception is relevant to translation in at least three ways. First of all, obviously, reading is literally a kind of perception. You're seeing and processing words on a page or on a screen or listening to an audiobook if you want to count that. Um, I'm not going to get into that today. Ultimately, I do think it's relevant. I think um, reading is not medium neutral. Reading on a page actually is a different thing than reading on screen. 
with effects that carry forward into the thinking or translating or writing that you do afterward. But that's not what I'm talking about today. Perception is also relevant at the other end of the process um, because art, whether literary or visual, or I suppose even musical, changes how we perceive. It renews our perception of the world. Viktor Shlovsky writes about this, by defamiliarizing our dead cliched ways of seeing, art makes the stone stony again, as he puts it. Bringing the world back to vivid life, or not even back, but bringing it to a new kind of life that we haven't experienced yet. So reading not only is perception, it changes the nature of our perception going forward. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a third way that perception is relevant as a kind of analogy for reading, especially reading with intent to translate. What I want this analogy to do is break our sense of a subject-object dichotomy which organizes so many of the ideas we have about translation. And perception is our most fundamental model or image of that dichotomy, the idea that we're in here confronted with something out there in the world and that this split between the subject and the object is how life works. That's what it means to be a self, to be in here with everything else out there. I want to talk about the philosophy of perception in a way that will break the hold of that assumption. In truth, we don't perceive a world that is out there separate from us, we perceive and live and move within this world as part of it. So too, what we read isn't out there in the book until it's in here in our brains. A text that we translate isn't being brought somewhere, say from German to English. There's a more dynamic interaction, a more dynamic interplay in translation between the self and the other, the source and the target, the author and the translator. So if I can convince you that there's no subject-object divide, even when it comes to something like seeing a chair, then maybe you'll believe that there's no such split in reading and translating something that someone else wrote. The philosopher of perception that I lean on the most because I think he gets it right is uh, Merleau-Ponty, whose main book is called The Phenomenology of Perception. Now, let me start by saying that phenomenology is a truly awful word. It's easy to stumble over it when I type it or write it. All those little N's and M's with their arches slow me down. Uh, I have like typos or handwritten crossouts from skipping letters like way more often than with any other word. The stress shifts in the different forms. So if you're sort of using it in a paragraph, it, you'll stumble over phenomenon, phenomenology, phenomenological. Um, and even just to say it at all, your mouth has to kind of lurch back and forth between the, the front and back vowels. I mean, if you say it out loud, pay attention to your jaw, phenomenology. And then what does it even mean? So zoology is about animals, geology is about the earth. What is phenomenology even about? You look at the word, it means the theory of things. Um, it's a philosophy term, but it isn't useful like epistemology, which is arcane, but specific to some specific arcane thing that we need a word for. The meaning of phenomenology shifts around because it always exists in opposition to something else, and that something else is different in different contexts. All this is too bad because what the word is supposed to describe is really the opposite of this vague, annoying situation. Um, let me just say, uh, forgive me if this is familiar ground for the philosophy people in the audience, um, but I am assuming that there are also some students or some translation people without a, a huge background in philosophy. So I did want to cover the basics. Um, when Hegel published The Phenomenology of Spirit in 1807, the title was meant as almost an oxymoron. 
a, a phenomenology of spirit being a description of the visible external phenomena that express the spirit or idea. So what the phenomenology of spirit basically means is tracking the outer manifestations of inner reality as a kind of paradox. According to the OED, the first use of the word in English is from the Encyclo Encyclopedia Britannica, third edition, 1797. And if you go and look what they're talking about as phenomenology, uh, they're talking about Newton's optics and explaining the observed motion of heavenly bodies. So again, phenomenology here means studying external visible phenomena. And that's not what later philosophers from Husserl to Merleau-Ponty to today tend to mean by that term. They're trying to get at not the phenomena, but the event of experiencing. Phenomenology is the practice of staying grounded in real lived experience and paying attention to what it feels like to actually be doing whatever it is we're talking about or living through whatever it is we're talking about. You might say that what I gave you a minute ago is a phenomenological description of the word phenomenology. What it's concretely like in your mouth, under your hand, what using the word actually feels like. It's a very vivid down to earth approach and I wish there was a more natural word for it, but there isn't. And it's no coincidence that there isn't because staying grounded in real experience looks different depending on what that's opposed to. You can't call something real out of context, only in opposition to something else. Um, there are classic examples of this in philosophy. If you say something's a real duck, what you mean is different depending on whether you're saying it's not a decoy duck or not a goose or not tofu or not like those scraggly pathetic specimens of duckhood on that other guy's farm. My ducks are the real ducks. The meaning of real depends on the opposition it's in. And in the same way, phenomenology is a rejection of some other position, so it looks different in different contexts. The difference between a phenomenological description of something and just a good description of something is exactly this sense of being opposed to some existing theory that you're going to come back at the end and refute. Otherwise, there's no point in going through the description at all. So really, my description of the mouthfeel of the word phenomenology isn't really a phenomenological account unless it's in a context where some other person is arguing that the sound of a word and the spelling of a word are arbitrary and have no significance, and I'm giving this description to come back and argue that the lived experience of the word is part of what the word means. That is what doing phenomenology with that kind of description would mean. So Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception isn't really a theory or a set of scientific claims about perception as much as a bunch of reminders which we're meant to buy into because the examples are so good. And then we're supposed to realize that these other theories we're in the grip of can't be true. So for example, take the idea that when we see a chair, what's happening is that stimulus comes in and we process it inside. There's light bouncing around in the world. The light that hits your retina gets converted to information and sent to your brain, which then makes some kind of mental picture of what you're seeing. So this seems self-evident. It hardly even seems like a theory until Merleau-Ponty comes along and says, it doesn't explain anything. How can your brain see a mental picture? Is there a little man in there with his own little retinas seeing the little picture? You've just displaced the problem of how we relate to the world inside our heads. He gives various other refutations of ideas like this as well in different registers, you might say, depending on what he's arguing against at any given part of the book. So there are scientific refutations. Merleau-Ponty is much better informed about real science 
and receptive towards using it uh, than most other philosophers of his time. So he might talk about people with brain damage to certain parts of their brain that they can still recognize chairs even though they can't analyze pictures or, or stuff like that. Um, and there's also his argument from lived experience. Um, so there's a chair over here. You're going to have to imagine it since we're all on Zoom. But when I see this chair over here, I'm not, in fact, being confronted with sense data, as the philosophers like to say, and then my brain processes it. Hmm, those splotches of color over there, are they a table? Are they a sunset? Are they my mother? No, it's a chair. Like, that's not what's happening. Um, and any counter argument which says, oh, it happens automatically, or it happens unconsciously, or by habit, is just a dodge, which lets the philosopher or scientist say it's happening, but it's not actually happening. What's actually happening is that I'm seeing a chair. I'm not seeing photons or sense data. I'm seeing a place to sit. That's what seeing a chair is. Nor, by the way, am I seeing a surface, the front of a chair, and then I have to logically infer that actually there's a three-dimensional object there. That's not how it works. A chair, like everything in the world, is something we see from one perspective and not all perspectives at once because it exists in the world. And we have a body that exists in that same world. There's no better God's eye view that would let us see every side of the chair at once because that's not how seeing works. Seeing means locating a thing in the world, the same world that I'm in. So it's necessarily going to be in a certain position that isn't mine at a certain distance from me with a front and a back relative to me. Uh, the fact that the chair's in the world means it's going to block my view of some things like a wall behind it. It might be behind other things that block our view of it. It has a front and a back. And we can see the back if we turn the chair around or if we walk around to the back or if we use a mirror. Um, if it's a different kind of thing in the world, we see the different parts of it in other ways. For example, by walking inside it. When we walk down a street, we don't see the front of the buildings. We see the buildings. That's what it means to see a building. If we want to see more of it, we go in the front door. So, well then, the well-trained philosophy major might say, what about Potemkin villages? Or what about movie sets where they're not actually buildings? Uh, this is where Merleau-Ponty makes a move that is intellectually really satisfying. He says that the illusion relies on the usual case. It presupposes the usual case. We wouldn't and couldn't call something an optical illusion except against the baseline of normal experiences. Sometimes an apple's in a bowl and sometimes an apple is sitting on a table. Neither one is a problem. We don't call an apple in a bowl some kind of trick, but we say a Potemkin village is a trick because we normally see buildings, not facades of buildings that are fake. That is what the trick is. The case of the facade doesn't prove we're only seeing surfaces. Instead, our ordinary life is what makes the facade an exceptional case of something. This is so satisfying because philosophers and scientists often like to use some outre optical illusion or experiment with patches of colored whatever to say what you've thought is true your whole life isn't true at all. Even if we're convinced, it's sort of grudgingly, we're unsettled, we're frustrated, but then Merleau-Ponty comes along and says, no, you were right all along. You really do see buildings. Um, and we can make this same move about translation too. Uh, the annoying claim that translation is impossible actually rests on the obvious fact that translation is possible and happens all the time. If there were no such thing as successful translation, then there couldn't be mistranslation because there'd be nothing we could say the instance is failing to do. 
when my cat meows, it's not a mistranslation of whatever I just said, it's just some other noise. Everything would be like that if translation really were non-existent or impossible. Therefore, mistranslation proves the existence of translation, QED. Um, I can't go through all of Merleau-Ponty's insights on perception and what he draws out of them. There are semester-long graduate courses on the phenomenology of perception, the book. Um, the, the point I want to make here and, and use here is that perception involves a kind of intentionality, which doesn't mean doing something on purpose. It means perception embodies implicit or explicit intentions. When I see something, my body is directed in a certain way. My actual or potential actions are pointing towards something. To see a chair doesn't mean there's a physical object in space with a location on some grid, and I, a disembodied gaze or some kind of robot camera, am receiving information about that object. Seeing a chair means now there's somewhere I could sit, a chair. That's the basic level perception operates on. The fact that I can sit in it is what makes it a chair. I can't see a chair without, so to speak, being aware of potentially sitting in it. I recognize it as a chair because I've gone over and sat in such things before. That's how I learned as a child what chairs are and what the word chair means. And I also know how to go about looking at the back of the chair or the bottom of the chair if I feel like doing that for whatever reason. So in other words, the intentionality isn't some feeling or reaction that comes later. Just like I don't run through a mental list of all the things those splotches of color might be, I don't calculate what I might do with the chair after I see it. So should I throw it? Should I eat it? Should I walk through it? No, I guess I'll sit in it. That's not what happens. Seeing a chair is seeing something you sit in and what I'm seeing over there is a chair. This doesn't mean there's any mind control involved. The chair isn't forcing me to sit there. There are all sorts of reasons why I might choose not to. Maybe there's a reserved sign on it. Maybe I'm standing at the podium at the moment. Maybe I'm not tired or it's in a museum in a Bauhaus exhibit behind a rope. I'm not gonna go sit there. Still, the chair in a way actively suggests or proposes that we might sit there. It's the kind of thing we might sit in. Otherwise, what we're seeing in the Bauhaus Museum would be a sculpture, not a chair. This interaction between my body and the chair is not a juxtaposition of purely physical objects in space or a relationship between one subject and one object. It's what Merleau-Ponty calls a living bond. Uh, in French, there's a lovely way to express this dynamic that Merleau-Ponty takes great advantage of with the word sens, S-E-N-S, -S, cognate with the English word sense with an E at the end, sens. There are four meanings of sens. First, one of the five senses, touch, smell, hearing. Second, it means judgment or intelligence, like in the English common sense or being sensible. Third, it means meaning, like the meaning of a word. In English, we don't usually say the sense of a word, but we do talk about the sense of a passage or about a word in the literal sense or the figurative sense, meaning the literal or figurative meaning. And then fourth, sens means something that sense does not mean in English, which is direction or way. Um, east or west, going the right way, turning a knob the wrong way, one-way street, a sweater put on back to front. All these locutions use the word sens in French. And this multivalence is perfect for Merleau-Ponty, who says that perception with your five senses is an active act of the intelligence, not just passively receiving information. It intrinsically involves recognizing the meaning of the thing, a chair, something you sit in. 
And it's a kind of existential moving in the thing's direction. Knowing it's a chair depends on a precognitive familiarity I have with such things. It depends on my ability to, in principle, go over there and sit down. I know what to do with it. It's part of the world I live in. There's sense in my relation to it. Another word for all this that isn't French and not Merleau-Ponty's was coined by a man named James J. Gibson. One of the totally bizarre facts of 20th century intellectual history is that an American psychiatrist studying how pilots perceive planes taking off and landing ended up with the exact same ideas as a French philosopher reading his Heidegger and Husserl. Even though they didn't know each other's work at all, during World War II, Gibson worked for the US Army and helped develop aptitude tests, visual aptitude tests for people who wanted to be pilots. He worked entirely as a scientist and he ended up with the same model of perception as Merleau-Ponty. My explanation for this amazing coincidence is that they were both right. Um, if Merleau-Ponty leaves you thinking that all sounds good, but how is it scientifically possible, then Gibson is your guy. Uh, his main books are The Senses Considered as Perceptual Systems from 1966 and The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception from 1979, which are as fascinating and eye-opening as Merleau-Ponty's. Um, Gibson calls it the ecological approach. That's his terminology for the fact that we share a world. The seer and the thing being seen aren't separated, but they move within a system of these living bonds. Um, I don't have time to summarize Gibson's incredible work, unfortunately, but I want to use a term he coined and just pretend it's Merleau-Ponty's too. And that term is affordance. The affordances of the environment, Gibson says, I'm quoting here, the affordances are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill. Gibson talks about animals to emphasize the ecological aspect, that there are all sorts of different creatures with different life worlds sharing the same space. Quote goes on, the verb to afford is found in the dictionary, but the noun affordance is not. I've made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. To perceive things in the environment is to perceive what they afford. This is a radical hypothesis, for it implies that the values and meanings of things in the environment can be directly perceived, and also that they are external to the perceiver." End of quote. A chair, for example, affords us the possibility of sitting in it, and that affordance is fundamental and primary. We're not seeing an object, we're seeing a place to sit. The ground or a floor is what we vertical flightless bipeds stand on. It affords us support. A mug is an affordance to pick up and drink my morning coffee out of it. A cliff affords us the negative possibility of falling off it. A friend is an affordance to say hello, among many other things. The world is not full of dead objects in space that we have to give meaning to. The world contains ground, sky, things to pick up, places to sit, obstacles, allies, things with meaning. It's an ecosystem of actions and interactions, real and potential. As Gibson says, to identify something is to perceive what can be done with it, what it's good for, its utility. So this is how we can let go of the subject-object split. The animal and the environment share a world where each beckons to the other, intending something from the other. 
Gibson also points out, by the way, uh, this will come back, that tools disprove the subject-object split because they show that various quote-unquote objects can merge with or then detach from the self or the body. There's no hard and fast border to what's me. When we're holding a pair of scissors, we've changed the abilities of our hand, and so we're in a different dyad with the affordances of our environment. There are different things we can now do with the world. The world affords different possibilities. A guitar lets us make sounds in a different way, and then we can put the guitar back down again. While I'm holding the guitar, it isn't playing music. I'm playing music, but I'm a different body than I am without a guitar. My glasses don't see the chair when I'm wearing glasses. I see the chair even if I couldn't see it without the glasses. Okay, so let's get back to reading and translation. Merleau-Ponty uh, extends his theory to language, both in the phenomenology of perception and in other texts. Um, but what he has to say mostly concerns the issue of access to other minds. So here too in his philosophy, some allegedly objective thing is revealed to be part of a lived interaction. He talks about how in a conversation with someone, we're not hearing words, we're hearing the other person. When we talk, we don't have thoughts in our head that we then somehow look up words to express out there in the world, having the thoughts and saying the words are coextensive. This account is in a very French tradition. Um, I don't actually remember if Merleau-Ponty mentions Proust, but Proust has a well-worked out theory along these lines about reading. Uh, he says that truth and real knowledge are unearthed in solitude while socializing is a total waste of time and a terrible way to spend your life. Um, what's great about reading is that you get to experience other people's thoughts and ideas while still being alone. He calls it, this is a quote, this fruitful miracle of communication in the bosom of solitude. There's an essay by Georges Poulet written after Merleau-Ponty called The Phenomenology of Reading that takes the same tack. He says, the thoughts of a book, quote, are the thoughts of another, yet it is I who am their subject. I am thinking the thoughts of another as my very own when I read something. Now, these French theorists aren't using Gibson's term, but basically they're treating language as a Gibson-style tool, an extension of the speaker's or writer's body through which we have direct access to them or we give other people access to us. Like seeing through glasses, we communicate through words. I think that this is a good description of reading in general. But remember, I said that reading like a translator is different. So I think it's the account of perception at the center of Merleau-Ponty's philosophy with its intentionality and its Gibsonian affordances uh, that's applicable to language in a different way. What it describes is what I'm calling reading like a translator. Language doesn't disappear as a tool of interpersonal communication. It's still there with its affordances. The text is a world populated with stuff the translator moves around in and does something with. Other theorists have also described the affordances of language. A question or statement doesn't leave us free to pick from some infinite menu of possible responses, it channels our appropriate responses and our possible inappropriate responses into a relatively small subset of all the words and gestures that exist in the world. Just like there's a relatively limited number of things you can do with a coffee mug. 
some of the people who've described this are Wittgenstein on language games, or Bakhtin on speech genres, or the sociologist Irving Goffman on what he calls rules of response in his great book, Forms of Talk. So in one example, um, Goffman describes a meta schema of 15 categories and subcategories in response to someone saying, do you have the time? He gives 30 different kinds of reply, including jokes, flirting, being a smart ass and saying yes, saying you don't speak English, correcting the actress's line reading, and including actually just telling the person what time it is. So there are lots of possibilities, but they're not endless, and they have a structure. One of the things we're invited to do with an utterance, one possibility an utterance affords us, is to translate it. And if we do, we're guided by the original text, which proposes or affords us a large but far from infinite range of appropriate translations. So to translate is to act on the kind of taking up the text affords. So what do we gain by applying this new terminology of affordance to translation? The point is not to just re-describe knowing what foreign words mean with some new philosophical term. The point is to get around the false dilemma of whether a translation or a translator is or should be free. Translators are never free to choose their translation. We're actually guided by the original, the same way a chair makes us see it as a chair. Again, that doesn't mean we're enslaved, we can use a chair as a table or a sculpture or a battering ram, but we are prompted to see it as a chair because it is a chair. So am I saying that the original text determines or quasi determines the translation? Well, yes, that's what makes it a translation. How could something be a translation if the original wasn't guiding how it turns out? I can't say in detail how the original determines the translation any more than Merleau-Ponty can lay out precisely the list of criteria that makes a chair a chair. He can only remind us that we do, in fact, recognize chairs. And I'm reminding us that texts ask to be translated in a certain way. When translators are responding to a text, that's literally what we're doing the text speaks to, it speaks first, making its own demands. So all the philosophical dilemmas about whether translation is a transformation of the original or a recognition and reflection of what's there, we need to let go of those too. This is exactly the dichotomy Merleau-Ponty's account of perception is trying to free us from. Are we seeing imperial, empirical objects or constituting them with our minds? Neither. We recognize things in a world we live in and have the power to transform. A chair is something we can go sit in. A mug is something we can pick up. Translators don't simply recognize what's there, but nor do they transform it into something it isn't already. What we're doing is moving through the original text's world. As a translator, I take up the affordances of the original, moving through it and constantly invite it to respond in certain ways. Now, that was probably a lot more philosophy than most of you bargained for and less about actual translation. I do want to bring up at least one simple, concrete example before we open it up. Um, so here's an example. Um, I retranslated Max Weber's vocation lectures, which were given as popular talks in late 1917 and early 1919. There were two lectures. And when I did, I tried to make them sound like popular lectures in English too. Uh, academic German is a famously laborious, dense style. 
And I admit, academic English is not always the snappiest possible writing either, but we can at least try to make it vigorous and direct. The earlier translations of Weber, even the better ones, included translations like, let us begin by making clear what is meant in practice by, which I translated as, let me first clarify. 12 words, now four words. Or there was, we can see very clearly that the latest developments are moving in the same direction as, which became in my version, the clear trend is toward five words instead of 16. How should we describe what this new translation is doing? The opposition going back to Horace and Jerome is that you can translate word for word or translate for the sense, the meaning. Those earlier Weber translations are word for word, and mine isn't. I went and checked, and that 16-word phrase from the earlier translation, sure enough, is exactly 16 words in the German. So in a negative sense, my version is not word for word, and that's good. But both my translation and the earlier ones preserve the same meaning equally. So that's not something we can say my translation is doing better. I think that the conventional wisdom nowadays is that translators try to create the same effect or impact as the original. This is obvious in the case of humor. If there's a joke in the original, you have to make it funny. It doesn't matter if the literal meaning of the joke is the same as whatever was funny in the original. Um, so I think this idea of translating to get the same effect is true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough because effect is a directional idea like intentionality the quote unquote same effect won't be the same effect once it's aimed at a different group of readers. If you say that you're trying to translate to create the same effect, that sounds like you're working on the text, but really you're working to set up a relationship with the new readers. That's where the effect happens. If anything, the relational aspect is predominant. In our Weber case, I actually don't think my translation is creating the same effect. I think those bad wordy translations do create the same effect, but the effect is a good one on the German speakers and a bad one on the English speakers. Um, the only way to argue that, let me first clarify, has the same effect as, let us begin by making clear what is meant in practice by, is to zoom out really far and say that what the effect is, is that it sounds good. That makes the concept of translating for the effect pretty useless and empty. The German sounds right to the German audience and we want the English to sound right to the English audience. And that rightness depends on the reader's expectations or the genre of lecture in that language and context more than it does on anything inherent in the text. So what I'm doing, what the new translation is doing with the Weber is aiming it at the new audience in a way that corresponds with how it was directed at the original audience. My slogan, not word for word, not translating for the sense, not translating for the effect, my slogan would be translate for the sens, all four aspects of that the sensual qualities of the words, its meaning, of course, its intelligence, and its directedness, the vector that's pointing it at its audience. What makes this Weber case a very simple example is that these phrases I've quoted are pure rhetoric. There's no content. Basically, they're just moving the audience along and queuing up the next step in the argument. Here I'm about to say is blah, blah. Things get more complicated when we're translating a sentence with substance or even literary quality. What does it mean to talk about direction there? But uh, at this point, I'm going to stop 
and start up the conversation. I've gone on long enough. Thank you very much for listening. And, um, and thank you very much. Hi, Damien. Thanks Hi, so much. This is the place where there would be a lot of applause. So we'll just imagine it's happening. It is strange to read into nothing. Like, you know, I had a couple laugh lines, but <laughs> just have to hope for the best. We'll hope. Um, so we're going to, there's a lot of clapping in the chat. We're going to talk a little bit together for a while, and then we'll open up to questions and answers um, from the listening and spectating public. I guess for those of you listening, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming. And uh, you can put your questions and comments into the Q&A, and we'll get to them when we finish up our conversation. We're going to take 15 or 20 minutes to do that. So first, I want to thank you. I feel like I've always felt that translators were full-fledged living human beings who have deep and complex experience of literature, let's say. But translation theory never presents them that way. <laughs> All the translators I know are like that, um, uh, even more sometimes than literary critics. So I feel like I feel like there's a whole new way, maybe for people who are getting into translating, to think of it. I wonder if you have advice for a young translator about how to become a phenomenological reader or how to think of their translating in that way. How did you come to this? What would it mean to switch their their attention from an accounting style of translation or a lexical style of translation to this one? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure that reading a book on the philosophy of translation is the key to this personal transformation. I mean, um, both you and Robin talked about this weird kind of split between translation theory and uh, translation practice that, that I have felt too. You know, there are things like chess theory where it really helps you play chess. And then there are things like philosophy of science where being a philosopher of science isn't even trying to have much of anything to do with like being a practicing experimental scientist. I guess some philosophers of science might disagree, but I think in general, um, you know, translation theory has not seemed of very much practical use to me either, um, as well, you know, similarly to the other translators I know. Um, that said, there are things I've, done, for example, in teaching classes and workshops to kind of uh, swerve people into this mindset. You know, there are, um, uh, there are a lot of people often who've come out of language learning classes where so-called translation is like how you give people tests of if they know the dative case. And so people think that that's what translation is, that it's sort of scorable and you can get a 98 or you can get a 95 and, you know, that that's kind of your activity. And um, so just sort of reframing for people, for example, that, it, that you're writing something in English is often helpful. And once you, once someone is in that mindset, I think they are in the phenomenological framework or whatever you want to say, because, you know, they're going about the task the same way any other writer does of, you know, trying to make it work. It's this kind of inner, inner school marmish pedagogy that I think channels a lot of certainly beginning translators or sort of people who read book reviews and wonder like, oh, how can I judge a translation? You know, I don't know the original. Well, same way you judge any other book about anything, like you judge it, you read it and it's a book and you have a relationship to it, you know, it's the same. So um, 
there are a lot of these little phenomenological reminder moves mm -hmm. that if you wanna put it that way, I throw out in classes a lot, like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, Virginia Woolf didn't know what it was like to be Lily Briscoe either, you know? <laughs> and mm -hmm. just like reminding people of that lets you kind of snap out of some of these more rigid kind of prejudices. So there's a kind of a process on, that authors go through too, I guess, in your, in your account of getting to know their characters or of living alongside their characters. And that leads me to a question that I wanna ask you. Um, it's very intimate uh, person to person relationship as you present it, at least in my reading, that the translator and the author really get together and they have to occupy the same world and they have to get oriented at least within the range of possible orientations to things. Um, I wanna lead towards an area that I think is in the background, but you don't touch, and that is the alienating effects of this. But I want to start with the. Well, yeah. Let me let me respond to the first half because I'm not sure I totally agree. Uh, someone asked me in a in an interview once, you know, how do I see my translation of? In this case, it was a Norwegian writer named Jan Fasa. Uh, how do I see my English as being in dialogue with Norwegian? And my answer was, I kind of don't. I think that if my English is in dialogue with Norwegian, that's a problem. That's like what translatorese is, mm -hmm. when the English isn't fully English, when the English is like trying to do Norwegian things in Norwegian ways, that's bad. Um, what I want is to have the book be fully English, not in dialogue with Norwegian at all. And but so- Does that not require that the same worlds be operative? One thing you say is you're orienting towards these objects that are meaningful objects in a certain world. What if there just aren't those objects in English? Yeah. Um, well, so do you mean the thing like, you know, if they're describing some kind of food that we don't have in America, what do you do? Or are you in the more- Whole other semiological sense? frames of reference. You can look at Proust as one, not only is it an alien world because it's 19th century, mm -hmm. right? It would be, unless we had Proust, it would be quite impossible for us to imagine the relationship between his feelings and the stairway in his home or something, Marcel's feelings. Well, but that's no different than reading Proust in French, you know? Uh -huh. So yeah. um, there's no, there's no like pure mind meld with an author in the absence of translation. And it's not even an issue of like, if I'm in French, I have direct access because, you know, they're editors, they're publishers, people have put a certain cover on the book. If it's taught in a course, a professor has framed it. If it's in a bookstore, it's displayed in a certain way. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's kind of like seeing all the sides of it shared once. That's just not how seeing works. So mm -hmm. we're not like failing to do anything by having our own personal relationship with someone's different experience that they're sharing with us. I don't know if that is your question. Yeah. Well, I feel like one thing about phenomenology is that it assumes one world. And one thing about literature is that it assumes a variety of worlds, even within one work of literature. Yeah. If especially if you're talking about a novel, there are parts of a novel and perspectives in novels that are not translatable among each other. Um, or misunderstanding at least. You know, that's a really interesting way to put it. And I have a couple of sort of gut responses. One is uh, specifically to the phenomenology presupposes one world thing. Um, one is, well, good, because so does translation. You know, translation 
presupposes that you can say the same text in different languages, that we're all human beings and, you know, share a world. I don't know that phenomenology is quite as um, Pollyanna-ish and, and or sort of hegemonic and dominant in terms of imposing one world on everybody else and everything else. I, I don't really see it that way. You know, there are, there are negative affordances, there's conflict. Um, you kind of still have to be in the same world as someone to have conflict with them. Um, so I, I guess I, I guess phenomenology sort of imposing a unified world onto reality kind of sounds worse than it is. I want to say like, as opposed to, to what? I mean, like what kind of harm is phenomenology doing? By, by doing this thing you claim it is, you know? So I, I have different responses. I do think that um, yeah, I mean, maybe that, that's kind of like the, the, the positive side of Gibson talking about environment. You know, animals of all the different species don't share a world, but they share an environment is one thing that the theorists sometimes say, you know, like they are actually all there. You know, we, we're all there. There's a chair in the universe and there's me in the universe. So well, there are do different you want to talk about it sharing the same world or not? I appreciate emphasizing the shared part of it. I think that's different than theories of translation that emphasize foreignness. But then there's some stumbling blocks. I want to ask you particularly about literary translation and that thing called style, which can be really foreign, styles one from another. I look at your amazing roster of translations from Walser to Dublin, and it's very hard to imagine more different styles, though you could say that they overlap in some sort of realism, hyper-realisms, edging on surrealism. Um, how does style figure into your theory? Yeah, well, that's the sort of literary stuff that I left off at the end because it takes a while to sort of explain. I mean, do you want me to give like a longer example-y case or- I can't hear what the audience is saying, but I'm assuming they're all saying yes. Okay. Well, th this is somewhat shorthand then, but- um, this is an example I've um, I've talked about before. So if you actually just Google my name and not this but that, you'll see um, an essay or two where I talk about this. So one thing in German is that they like to say not this but that. They say uh, the train is leaving at not six but five thirty. They say I'm going to order a not hamburger but kale salad. And in English, we usually put things forward, forward from an English perspective, meaning I, uh, I want a salad, not a burger, or, oh my God, the train leaves at 5.30, we're late. It doesn't leave at six. You know, so, um, so the German way of flipping it around feels like this kind of maddening little detour to English readers. But in German, it has this very, uh, actually kind of kind and beautiful vibe of, I'm gonna bring you even closer because I care. And because, you know, I want to get closer to what's really going on. So the, the train leaves at not six, but 5.30 sort of enacts this, um, you know, consideration. But you can't do that in English all the time. It just feels wrong. So, what you do as a translator is usually just flip it around like I did with the train, or you sort of expand it out and be like, uh, it doesn't leave at six, you know, what because of blah, 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 and what really happened and uh, it leaves at 5.30, like there, that makes sense. It doesn't feel like some pointless detour. Or you can often just turn it into an and if there's not really 
a contrast. Like, you know, the bar serves not only beer, but also wine is very normal in German, but we would just say beer and wine because there's no tension there. So I never knew this. No one ever taught me this. Like it doesn't come up in German class. It's just something that you picked up or that I sort of picked up in reading. I usually, or in translating, I'd usually flip it. But then there was this one author, Uwe Janssen, author of Anniversaries, where over and over and over again in my drafts, I kept finding this, not this, but that. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, why, why does this keep happening? And the reason it keeps happening is because there's no writer ever who is as committed to homing in step by step on the truth. Like that's his whole ethics. That's his whole being. So of course he's gonna take some resource of the German language and push it. That's what writers do. So as a translator, this is now a new problem because if I have the 57th example of not this, but that, is it just a German tick where there's no reason to keep it? And in fact, it's a bad literal translation if you keep it. Or do you, or is it the writer? Is it what you're translating for? So the, the, way, I, the way I think of it is that um, Janssen is sort of pulling the German language in a certain direction. And I have to, pull English. So if you think of an arrow, I have to start from a different place, namely the English language. And I have to point in a different direction, namely the English reader, but it has to be the same arrow. So that's at least a kind of outline of how I think of more literary issues of style mm -hmm. in the context of this argument about sauce and intentionality and stuff. I see that that's a kind of, you look for the intention. I mean, in that case, it's kind of an author's intention with the language. So maybe that's how you would deal with style as opposed to the world of the text. And yeah, the but it's not what people usually mean by intention. You know, like um, it, it's, not, it's not their conscious plan. I mean, it really is more their intentionality than their intention. You know, orientation towards he, the orientation, right? These directional sort of vector metaphors, I think, are good. Because, you know, Uwe Janssen wasn't just deciding to use this phrase a lot. It's that that's how German works and that's how his mind works. So, in doing the kind of book he wanted to do, German offered him that possibility, which he took, you know? So that's not exactly intention, but you still have to somehow parse out as a translator, you know, what's just baseline, what's just like normal and there's no need to preserve it mm -hmm. in, a, in a different language versus what's, you know, in, has intentionality in this other sense, yeah. I like this. I think it opens up to a whole, at least a, a way in which you're not um, worried about equivalences and all sorts of other claptrap of translation theory. Yeah, I mean, let me give maybe one other example in terms of this equivalences thing. You know, uh, German has very simple verbs and very vibrant, vital nouns. The nouns have this compounding and these prepositions and all this energy in there. Um, Whereas in English, the action is in the verb. You want to use a, um, you know, spicy, vivid verb, as opposed to just say go or make or put and have the energy be in the nouns. Um, I guess I can give an example from uh, philosophy. You know, Marx will have these very complicated, interesting, neologistic compound nouns and say one of them is standing opposite the other thing. You know, like the commodity nature of the object is standing 
in front of, you know, the congealed labor power of the whatever, whatever. And it just sounds awful in English because you have these two dead abstractions just standing there. There's no action in the verb, there's no life. But in German, it works. It's very so kind of balanced and interesting, right? So if you're translating, the point isn't to literally get, you know, blah, 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 is standing opposite blah, 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 because in English that doesn't work. You know, push you a little bit on this because it just so happens I'm co editing a new edition of Marx's Capital with Paul Reiter, who's translating it. And um, these are things we encounter all the time. So you, you hit me in the heart with the Marx example. So are you saying that you would verbify Marx's nounifications? Well, you just have to, you have to decide because, of course, as with the Uwe Janssen example the substance or the content of what Marx is saying is that life force congeals into these dead capitalist objects. So the whole existence of that kind of noun phrase is like part of his point. So as with the Uwe Janssen, not this, but that, you can't just get rid of them all because it's not just a tick of the German language, it's part of the point. So um, appreciate that. Yeah, I want to ask one last question, and then I think we should open it up. This is like at the very extreme of your phenomenological theory. So you'll forgive me for saying, but what about, but what about Ceylon? What about writers who's who are writing to deform, reform language itself? And there isn't really a world. Of course, there's a world, but the world is language itself. Mm -hmm. And poetry leans towards that. So in a sense, your theory is really good for fiction or novels or prose. I would have said the opposite because I mean, the whole idea of deforming language is everything I've just been talking about for the last five minutes, right? So um, you, yeah, I mean, I don't know what kind of answer you're asking for exactly, but I, I think that I think that this is the whole, in a way you could say this is the strength of looking at both ends of the arrow, right? The the forward end, which way it's pointing, raises all these social interpersonal aspects of audience and um, you know, inclusion, exclusion, and dialogism and all this kind of stuff. Mm. But looking at the sort of back end of the arrow, like where Uwe Janssen is starting from to get to his not this but that's, or where Marx is starting from to get to his big compounds, you know, I think is like the poetry side. I think thinking of, I mean, I haven't thought about Paul Salon in these terms before explicitly, but, um, but I think that would be where I'd go. Great, thank you. I think it's time to invite others to ask questions. We have some questions already in the chat and q and I will try to keep my eyes on both. If you're game, Damien, I'll start reading them. Please. Sound good? Okay, I'm gonna take them sort of in the order they came in. Um, and I will read, I forgot to mention if you don't want your name mentioned to post your question anonymously. Since I have names, I'll assume you knew this. So this is from Ye Tian. Um, this says, thank you for this fascinating talk. The importance of the source text is obvious in how it leads the translators to create the target text. My question is, can we consider the source text separately from the original author? That is, can we value the source text while devaluing the author? thus to see translation as a way to subvert the author, but still under the guidance of the source text. Um, thank you for the question. And uh, that's another thing I hadn't thought of explicitly before. So this is a little bit of an off the cuff answer, but you know, that would kind of seem to me to be another one of those cases where translation doesn't change anything you could make the same 
question and answer about anyone's novel or poem. So can we, you know, how can we uh, address or grapple with someone's novel in isolation from who they are as a person? Seems to me to be kind of the same question. Maybe I missed a nuance of the question, but, um, you know, I don't, I mean, for literary texts, I tend to not think about the author that much. Personally, I'm like working on the text for more journalistic or biographical stuff. You know, I am seeing the text as a bit more transparent and a bit more just an expression of what the authors has to say. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't strike me as being any really different situation in translation than anything else. Okay, here's These another These questions qu are hard. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, we like that. You gave a hard talk, so you have to be ready. Here's one from Aaron Aji. Like the negative and positive affordances, isn't there also a type that can be called creative affordance? Well, sure. Um, I mean, I assume what the questioner means is uh, being invited to do something new as opposed to being invited to like follow orders. Um, and sure, obviously, yes, of course. Um, I mean, I actually think that there's some, uh, there's some debates in translation that this kind of way of thinking just doesn't end run around because either one works you know you can you can be someone's ally or enemy so talking about the relationship doesn't imply one or the other um, i'm thinking uh for example of um there's a great book called um transgressive circulation by Gorenson, who talks about how the um, kind of bougie standard model where, you know, translation is weird and, you know, we don't want to have young American impressionable poetry students reading Paul Salon whom they might not understand. And, you know, translation should be easy and smooth and he relates it to sort of classic MFA workshop style writing and also book reviewing about how a smooth translation is praise in a newspaper and stuff like that. Whereas he says that translation actually is a kind of inherently excessive and transgressive and risky and kitschy uh, mode that he likes. And that's good. And in fact, poetry's like that too. So instead of translation kind of conforming to a very placid poetry, this kind of craziness of translation can remind people that poetry blows your head off too. You know, so I don't think that the kind of model I laid out today really takes either of those sides because you know, what you're trying to do um, with, you're still trying to do something with an audience, whether it's mm -hmm. sort of conservative slash reactionary or, you know, liberatory slash smart ass, like you're still in a relationship with an audience. And in your terms, if the text, uh, imagine you're translating Ferlinghetti into another language, the text solicits some wildness from you. There is a kind of creative affordance given you by the creative affordance of the author. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, you can translate extremely placid Horatian odes into some like insane pornographic beatnik thing. Um, and so, you can also choose not to, you know, <laughs> like I... Uh, yeah, I like it. I feel, I feel like I want to, to try it, translating. 
Well, I mean, translating's fun, you know. Um, I want to read a question from Peter Cole, who has given me a quote. So I'm going to read it as Peter Cole. Thank you, Damien, for bringing us into the clouds of translational knowing and not quite knowing. <laughs> I have a question that might bring together the philosophical, literary, and pedagogical aspects of your thought and talk. Oh, all right. Quintessential Cole. One of our translation students at Yale recently said something in class about how struck she was by the profound instability of the process of translation for the translator as she has experienced it. What might you say to a young translator who's experiencing that destabilizing sensation in a particularly intense and new way? And how have you dealt with it over the years? Hmm. Well, uh, that question was probably written before the Gordonson answer. I mean, this is kind of what he's talking about. The, um, you know, translation is inherently going outside of, I mean, I don't like those spatial boundary things, but doing something different than what you're usually doing or doing it in a different way or sort of having to pay attention to how you and your language work in a way that you could get by without paying attention to it as you just use it in other contexts. So uh, I think that um, I personally kind of like it. I think if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be a translator. So if the student is saying, you know, how can I deal with the sense of instability? I mean, if they don't like it, they shouldn't do it. And if they like it, they should do more of it. You know, um, I, I think that, uh, I mean, maybe just to, to put it in one very concrete way, I didn't know about the not this, but that thing in English it had never occurred to me. You can say, you know, not this, but that. And you don't say it quite as often, but you can. And so I had used that phrase in my translations and never thought about it. But it, it was this encounter with a different person's use of their different language that made me learn something about how English works and this idea of cutting to the chase and saying the true thing first and then qualifying it. In fact, you know, I looked it up. So in German, there's the word, the way you say not this, but that, as you say, you know, nicht, whatever, sondern. Sondern is one word for, but rather. Um, so if you're a sort of one word fetishist, you can say that like German, has an elemental sense of this, but rather, I don't think it really makes that much of a difference whether something's one word or two words, but, um, but I was like, well, what about rather in English? Like, what does that word mean? Um, I don't know if you know, I didn't, I had to go look it up, but there's um, an old English word, hroth, which means fast. So rather means faster. Mm -hmm. So, it exactly means, oh, so I left out that Zondern is also a verb, which means to divide or separate. So in German, it's making distinctions. You separate out not six, but 530. That's how you, um, that's how you talk about two different things. And in English, you say rather, like I'm getting there faster. And so, that's something about English that I learned through this destabilizing process of translation, which is something I think is useful and that I enjoy. There's a question that, as you say in German, but I'll translate it, it sticks on to the end of this question really well. That is from Pilar Kau Meyer. Do you believe that by not translating all the semantic units in quote, the train doesn't leave at six, but at five? You are leaving out a nice piece of cultural information. I like it better the way you do it, but I just wonder if culture expressed in style is relevant phenomenologically. Yeah, I mean, of course, you have to make the decision of what you're gonna preserve. If you, if it's the kind of novel where sort of sociological insight into the German 
structures of communication, you know, are relevant, that would be different than if you're just translating some story and like just some, you know, someone forgot the diapers at home and, you know, oh my God, now he's running late. Like you, that might not be the time and the place to try and sort of teach the reader interesting information about how German moves through conflict situations. You know what I mean? So um, there's no hard and fast answer that like, no, you must never follow the German word order. But if it's just the German word order and it's not really carrying anything or doing anything else, then the place for that information is a book on the philosophy of translation and not in the middle of a sentence in some short story where something exciting is happening. But that fits really well with your non-lexical approach because you're looking for the meaningful holes in this world and if you find them or the orientations that are meaningful in the language or to the characters or to the author and then you would want to um, be faithful in some sense to those. Well, I, I want to, you know, I mean, what it ultimately comes down to, like stripping away all the big words of my phenomenology lecture, like what it ultimately comes down to is I've read a book in another language that spoke to me and meant something to me. And it's not accessible to people who read only in English or English and some other languages. Um, and so I want to share that readerly experience. I want to give someone access to the readerly experience that I had. Um, I mean, that's kind of the human core, I think, of what, of what we're talking about. Um, you know, and so there's some things that I read where the specific words matter and there's some things where it's not about that. And so um, you have to just, what, I, what I'm trying to do is sort of be alive to the full spectrum of my reactions as a reader and make sure that whoever reads my English is gonna be able to experience those things as much as possible. That's really helpful. We're coming to the end of our time. I could throw out one more question, which is really a gift to you from Daniel Elkind, which is, is there an unlikely work that you've always wanted to translate? A passion project. You know, I have to say anniversaries kind of was my bucket list. You know, there are of course other things out there, but um, for those of you who don't know, it takes place in New York City where I grew up. It in fact takes place three blocks away from where I grew up. So this incredible Tolstoyan hyper-realist description of like the playground the characters go to is my playground that I went to every day as a kid. Uh, on top of all the literary qualities and just superb excellence of the book in every other way. So, and it's 1700 pages long. So it was quite a job to get funding and convince publishers and stuff like that. So, you know, that was the real book of a lifetime for me in truth. I, you know, I've climbed my Mount Everest. Now there are other mountains out there, but you know, Okay, so on that, I think we'll end. I wanna thank you, Damien, for a really brilliant talk, opening up whole other horizons on translating and translation theory. And thank you to the audience for great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, I'm sure- I am too, so thank you, everybody. Thanks.